I was asked just to take a quick look at a few issues that we face presently and trying to look to the future. Um, and just looking over the 20 year period from 97 up to the last set of full figures for the year end of 2016, that summarises the change. Change is ongoing. So we've 2,200 less dairy farmers in Northern Ireland. Uh, we've got 38,000 more dairy cows. So obviously that means a larger increase in herd size, and we've doubled herd size. We've added, what, come up on 120 kilos of milk solids for the average cow. But first and foremost, 700 million more litres of milk over that 20 year period that the processors, north and south, have made use of. Um, huge changes, and that's only over a 20 year period. I'm bringing it right up to today. I'm sorry for the number of figures, but just a couple of key ones I want to pick out. So that's the six counties. Currently, three and a half thousand dairy farmers. A third of those farmers are milking 100 or more cows. That's 1,200 farms with over 200,000 cows. In 20 years, that has changed. 20 years ago, 1997, there were only eight and a half percent of the herds in Northern Ireland had, were milking 100 cows or more. So I'll touch on the phrase that's used, is sustainable intensification. Huge difference, huge difference. A bit of useless information. Back in 1997, there were 22,609 cows in Fermanagh. Same number of cows, but half the number of farms. So just in one small area, cow numbers have stayed the same, but the number of uh, farmers have halved. And that's where we are at this moment in time. And down this part of the world, the average herd size is 127 cows. So even in a small place like Northern Ireland, average in County Down 108, you drive 60 or 70 miles into another county, and that's the average. So change is ongoing. The average man in Northern Ireland is now milking 90 cows. 97, what were the challenges? Isn't it interesting? The weather. We just had come out of deregulation in 95, where the old milk marking board, uh, there was open competition out on farms uh, for milk. So there was deregulation, big boost in uh, what milk was sought after in the supply and demand situation for milk. From 95 to 97, there was a 29% reduction in milk price. What have you folks faced? It's great to see where milk price is uh, going into this winter, but what did you face for the last couple of years prior to that? But the weather the dictating factor. In those days, milk quotas, there'll be young farmers in the audience, and it's great to see the number of young farmers who wonder what were milk quotas and what had you to do with them. We were dictated by EU market support. I've mentioned deregulation. And we were just recovering from the initial shock of BSE. Uh, John Gummer putting a burger into his young daughter's face and telling her it was safe. It didn't seem to allay consumer concerns. So there was no OTMS over 30 month scheme, limited market for beef, there was euthanasia of calves. Today, you can see it, the weather, certainly from where I travel down from, as Clarence Calderwood, where we are at this moment in time, big pressure on farmers, all farmers, due to the weather. But we've new quotas, and they're based around the environment. And like many another thing in Northern Ireland, they're not going away. We have got to learn we have certainly made big strides with regards to water quality, NAP and phosphate, and John will touch on that in more detail. But ones that have come along and more into the vocabulary, certainly in the last short period of time, is dealing with biodiversity and dealing with ammonia. We have got, we have got as an industry, we have got to create a roadmap to work our way through some of these new quotas. And I think a big challenge for many of the farmers looking for the development on their farm is the availability of quality labour. And I've emphasised quality labour. Yeah, you can get someone to hang on clusters, or you can get a robot to hang on clusters. But can you use the information that you're given to allow your farm to develop? Others with much more ability and knowledge than me <coughs> deal with the Brexit issue and volatility. 
That's a big change in 20 years. From 97, because of market support measures, volatility. Quotas haven't been a factor in Northern Ireland for a lifetime. I know there were parties in other part of the part of the island in 2015 when quotas were done away with. We haven't had quotas basically because milk quota could transfer into Northern Ireland from other parts of the UK. And over that 10 year period, and 97 is stuck in the middle of it, over that 10 year period, almost a 40% increase on the amount of milk quota compared to the other European regions. Change is ongoing, but for Northern Ireland, doing a good job getting as many pieces of the jigsaw in place and using the right people. Justin touched on it. Uh, I'm definitely not the sailor. You can see my cluggages were vertically challenged. We're overweight. Uh, with no power in our legs, we never had any pace, and James is following that. Um, <laughs> but you've got to get as many pieces of the jigsaw. And I've highlighted forage, and I'll come back to that. But it's getting as many pieces. Transition cow management, critical, particularly with the late summer and autumn that were faced with a lot of cows calving down <coughs> October, November time. We've got to get our genetics and our breeding right. Huge potential <coughs> untapped into. And that whole area of early lactation management. Profit, margin times volume. So you've got to get the milk price and our production costs. There's no point, because milk price is 30 pence a litre, letting our cost of pr production slip back up again. And I'll touch on that in a moment's time. <coughs> That's the latest results for year ending 31st of uh, March 17 from the benchmarking. The bottom quartile, where the average man is, the top, and then where are the really good men? The folk the farms, they're doing a top class job out there. A lot of information. Just something simple. Why did you put up back the scan? It's attention to detail. Good farmers make fewer mistakes. Good farmers make fewer mistakes. They're better at fertility. They're better at feed efficiency. They're better at breeding the right cow. Just a simple point. The top 10%, half the back to scan level. You can see the physical performance there. At the end of the day, between the top 25% and the bottom 25%, you're talking, and that includes an allowance of about three pence a litre for family labour. So about 500 odd <coughs> pounds a cow between those quartiles. That, that to major influence is under your control at farm level. A real achievement, something for 50% of the men currently and there's about 400 men in that data set there up to about the 28th of uh, September. 21 and a half pence cost of production, allowing for three pence family labour. Probably reduced by about two and a half to three pence over the last <coughs> couple of years. Needs must. That is a really positive message. That is a really positive message for you folks who are farming, milking <coughs> cows on a day and daily basis. All credit to you. I just emphasize the importance of efficiency. So if I standardize to 100 cows at the same milk price, at the same replacement rate, there's where your 50 odd thousand pounds difference between the quartiles come from. More efficient in the use of your concentrate and the volume of milk that you're producing. You control your cost, you feed own okay, 100 kilos more meal, but you have better control of your breeding costs better control of your veterinary costs, those variable costs, and again, better control of your overheads. So I'm not saying that's profit. I'm just saying that's money that has stayed within the farm gate for you to decide what you want to do with it. Whether that's purchase additional land, whether that's look about <coughs> investing off the farm, because there's other people in the far, uh, farm family to take account of when you retire. <coughs> I talked about EU support. So up to 2016 or 2006, we operated with EU support mechanisms. Uh, we had safety net, we had intervention, export refunds. Milk price probably averaged in around about 18 and a half pence, but never fell below 17 and a half, never went above 21 and a half. 
Take away EU support, so you're asking the changes on what we've had to learn. <coughs> Volatility. So back then, the start of the 2000s, average profit in around £400 a cow at a milk price of about 18p. Last year, 19.8. Couldn't get it onto the, all, all onto the wee bar, but it was 19.8. Rounded up to 20 pence a litre profit, let over £100 a cow for the average man. Volatility is here, and we have to build resilience into our industry to deal with it. Change is ongoing. Good farmers deal with it. But one clear message. And when you get old, there's, you know that you're getting old. There's four, happens, four things happen to you as a man when you start to age. James told me this. Uh, first one is you forget people's names. The second stage is you forget people's faces. Third stage is when you go to the loo, you forgot to fill your spare up when you come out. And the fourth stage is when you go to the loo, you forgot to pull it down. So um, <laughs> I'm rapidly heading that direction. So, um, but get better before you get bigger, both technical and business. Get better before you get bigger. Soil and nutrient management, John will touch on it. Back to basics. Quality forage, it's a long time since Gordon Newman told me a cow is not a sow. A cow is a ruminant. She's not a monogastric animal that can live in meal alone. Margin over concentrate, feed efficiency, herd fertility. If there was one thing that really the last previous two years of very poor prices taught, you need good herd fertility. Without it, you're always carrying too many passengers. Always carrying too many passengers. So good fertility is essential. Milk quality and lifetime yield. The average cow in Northern Ireland is doing about 27,000 litres, and I'll show you the importance of that. We've got to be targeting longevity, and we've got to be targeting milk quality, because Perrier and Rockwell and others can make money out of water. I don't think the dairy farmer can. On the business side, I touched on it before. You've always heard the saying, volume is vanity and margin is sanity. Margin protection exists in other parts of the world. That's what has given stability to the American industry. That's what has given the financiers in America the assurance of to invest in their industry is their margin protection policy. Understand the difference between cash and profit. There's a huge difference. Match your borrowings to earning power and link that to discipline flexibility. Yes. With that volatility, perhaps it is the right thing to go interest only for a couple of years. <coughs> but when the pressure's off, don't go crazy. Look about that disciplined flexibility to your borrowings. Have we been too rigid? Do we need to take a fresher look at that? You'll hear, I was going to say, when you're, when you're on mic, you probably are going to be quoted. Build resilience, you're going to hear resilience. What do I mean by that? Is it right that getting slurry out before the 15th of October is putting as much pressure on farmers as it's putting on them? The, me the mental pressure, the stress on our industry at this moment in time is palpable, folks. That's not good for resilience. Is it going to change? In my opinion, go First and foremost is an environmentalist. He's not an agriculturalist. Take from that what you will. And definitely, definitely, the pig man had to do it, save for a rainy day. You want me finished, William? Key message. Good farmers at a range of milk prices are profitable. Justin touched on it. Maybe we've got to adjust that graph. He picked that graph off me a couple of years ago when I did the UGS. Uh, they're inextricably linked. Oil price, milk price, or all agricultural commodities. Now, if the energy market changes, what do we track this with? So if one, somebody at this moment in time wants to know where's milk price going to be, where do you think oil price is going to be? They're strongly, they're inextricably linked. Yep, there's a lot of questions that have been asked within the last number of weeks. So there's a 10-year average for milk price was 24.37. The five-year average was 25 and a half pence. Make your own call about margin protect, <coughs> protecting your margin on your farm. What can you produce a litre of milk for? 
Can you produce it for 21 and a half? Can you actually do it for 19 and a half? Or is it taking you, like some people in that graph that I put up earlier, 29 or 30 pence? Because there's been the average of the milk price. At 28 or 29 pence, how many years out of the last 10 years have you hit a milk price? <coughs> you have got to make that decision on your farm. Back to basics. John will touch on these in more detail. Folks, that says it all of what we have to concentrate on and do better. And those statistics aren't good. That's not, I mean, what's farmers? Farmers farm the land. Whether you're growing potatoes, growing cereals, milking cows, producing beef, we farm the land. We've got to take care of our land. And some of the damage that has been done to some silage wards, it's evident we've only been drilling less than 2% of our land over the last number of years. So John will pick up, get simple things right, sulfur pays. I said I would come back to that replacement cost and fertility. And you can do this tomorrow morning in the back of an envelope, a calculator, or using your iPhone. You're building 100 cows, you're the average man at 7,500 litres. The average man brings in 31 heifers every year, but he only sells 26 cold cows. There's five who probably cost you 120 or 140 pounds, mm -hmm. and you don't get any call value for them. So the average, the average for the 26 that you sell is 530. Average heifer coming in, 14, 1500 pounds. It gives a depreciation charge between four and five pence a litre. That's why fertility, that's why calving heifers at two years of age Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely critical. What's the ideal system? What takes your box? What takes your box on your farm? What's the structure? What's the layout? What's the availability of the land? Are you heavily dependent on corn acre? Don't ignore that environmental legislation. And market demands. There's a lot of the processors sitting in the room. Are they giving you signals as to what quality of milk they want three years, five years <coughs> down the road? Because breeding is long term. If I started today and put a cow and calf, it's two years, two, no, three years before that heifer. It's nine months pregnancy. You get her into the system. It's five years before those people of a number uh, sufficient of those in the herd to be making a difference. Know your system, spring calving, more intensive, whatever it might be, and breed a cow for your system. Don't breed a cow and then think what system am I going to put out around it. <coughs> going forward, quality forage, you can read there yourself. Lawrence, I was down, a very interesting piece of work. Keep me right here, Lawrence, about 60% of profitability in the south is dictated by two factors, milk from grass and fertility. We don't have anything with the stream, same strength of relationship. But for us, from about six, six and a half thousand data sets of benchmarking information, the strongest relationship is MOC, margin over concentrate. Dictates about 40 to 42% of the difference between profitability between farms, followed by what milk you're getting from forage at somewhere around about 30, 35%. I can't, standing on the 12th of October and what we've had, make some comment about dealing with short term <coughs> issues on farm. I'm finishing here. The crew says it all. The weather has been difficult. But at farm level, you're going to have to make tough decisions. You're going to have to make tough decisions. There are many farmers, as we stand today at the 12th of October, about a third short in silage. How are you going to manage that? Do a feed budget immediately. And along with that feed budget, do a cash flow. Cash flow isn't for when milk prices are 20, 21, 22 <coughs> pence. A cash flow is for just the same when milk price is 30 pence a litre. And do it because concentrates, some of the prices they're talking about straw at the moment in my countryside, an eight before by three at over 70 pounds. Big bale, silage if you can get it. Concentrates, 
240 plus for a decent dairy concentrate. So, yeah, milk price is good. There's been real difficulty at farm level. I think the autumn has passed us by. Plan, sorry, plan for early action this year. Get cows out. Graze that silage ground. If you're, why, if you're out of silage or really crap silage in February, why would you not think of taking a quick skate out around the first cut silage ground? Needs must. Sustainability, it's a three legged stool. I don't have time to go into it, but it's a three legged stool. It's financial, and if I earn money, I can invest. I can invest in the environment. I can invest in myself. All work and no play will make you very, very dull, grumpy people. That you maybe it doesn't matter what side of the bed you get into because there's nobody else there to annoy it with you. <laughs> <laughs> what we do has got to be socially sustainable. Great if we had a straight road, and you can see down. But that's not where we are, and we don't take twists and turns before we get there. But one thing's for sure. If you're under pressure, you don't need surprises. So a good plan, a short-term feed budget, know how much silage I'm going to need, and what am I going to do if I'm short, and do a cash flow along with it to know what I have to do with regards to my overdraft to get me through this winter. Folks, thank you very much indeed.